Hi, I'm Paula Tiso, and welcome to my take of voiceover studio travelogue. Today, I am going to go visit with Larissa Gallagher, or as she says, Larissa Gallagher, because she's from Australia, and she lives here in Los Angeles, lives and works here in Australia. No. <laughs> She lives and works here in Los Angeles. She works in video games, she works in commercials, but I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go visit with Larissa and have her tell us all about it. Well, growing up in Australia, I find, I found that it's, especially in Perth where I came from, um, at the time that I grew up there, it was a very, for lack of a better term, it was like a glorified country town. So it had, about two million people that lived there, but it was quite spread out. Um, it really wasn't the town that you would expect, you know, I'm gonna go and make it in Hollywood. You know, it was like, it was the town where a lot of people grew up, had kids, um, retired, worked for a little bit, and that was it. It wasn't like a big hub of commercialism or anything like that. Um, so it was, I think I kind of grew up regular happy-go-lucky child, except I did, I was involved a lot in the ballet world. So I think I grew up generally assuming I was going to be a ballerina, but, but I decided that, uh, after I was about 16, that I enjoyed eating more <laughs> than <laughs> turning up the ballet studio. So, um, but I still like had that drive for theatre, so I could also sing, went into musical theatre then and uh, fortunately one of the best schools for musical theatre, uh, the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts, is located in Perth and you have to audition to get in and everyone auditions from around Australia, 16 or so people get in annually. Hugh Jackman went to that school as an example. Um, so that was kind of my entree into you go to Whopper, then you move to Sydney or Melbourne and then you start your, your big theatre career. So I did that and yeah, and kind of when I got to the big city of Sydney, it never quite worked the way I wanted. And, and I think because, you know, Australia has such incredible training for actors and there's such a drive and a desire for the people there, but the amount of things being created there, there's not a lot. And so there's a limited resource for actors to be employed in. And if you're good and you're very good, like anywhere, America or anywhere, people will want to work with their friends or work with people they've worked with before. So if you kind of miss your boat, train, whatever the analogy is yeah you can you kind of miss your turn and that was it and so I spent a long time really struggling to try and make it and then at one point just kind of had enough and gave up and that was it I think specifically what drew me to voiceover uh, was the fact that in Washington DC at the time when I started there were no agents no on camera no acting no nothing they just didn't you know there was a couple of casting houses but that was it so I kind of was forced to work out how to how to become a voice actor you know so and I think in the process of doing that I discovered a world of acting where I could be in control and I started to realize that all the for lack of a better term, mistakes I made in my career was that I had got, gone to school, studied, done all the quote-unquote correct things to do, then got an agent and went, great, do all the work for me, please. Find me work. I'll sit back, phone call, audition. I'll go and do my audition, come back. Make, you know, rather than doing anything on my own to facilitate my own career, I just didn't... I don't know whether people told me that and I just, it washed off me. I, I can't, I can't remember, I don't know. But the process in DC of going online and fully immersing and how do I do this and what can I do and, all right, there aren't agents in DC and, you know, I'm just starting out so I'm not going to move to LA or New York to somewhere and plus, you know, Ed works in, Ed, my husband works in DC, so what if I want to make this happen what can I do and there were and I think it was really it was the start of the big boom of home studios and doing stuff from home so I think it had been building 
but it was the kind of the start when all the pay to plays were still had integrity and were offering good work at reputable prices and things like that. And so for me, what drew me to voiceover was the fact that I could be in charge of my own career and that I knew that if ever I wanted to take it bigger and better and further, that I wouldn't always be beholden to an agent to make it happen for me. And I think I really understood the true process of how it worked. And that that was freeing for me because I could be in control and I could pass that off or pass it back. And it would be that true kind of give and take thing without just handing it to someone else and crossing my fingers and going, I want to be a star, you know, this type thing. So, yeah. Cool. So I finish every question with, so, yeah. <laughs> the projects that you would most know my voice from would be I did um, quite a long period of time working as the voice of Laguna Blue in Monster High. Um, I've also done a few video games. Uh, I've done a ton of mobile gaming, so it's probably a lot of stuff out there that you've heard me and I don't even know you've heard me in. Um, but I've done a few video games that have been very popular, Bless Online that is currently out, Agents of Mayhem, uh, a great phenomenal indie project called Rumu that was Australian, and then probably most well known is another uh, phenomenal indie video game called Firewatch, which please, if you haven't played it, go out and play it because it's amazing. Um, and I've got a few other projects coming up, which as always, I can't say anything yet, um, but a great little Mattel project called Enchantimals, which I think you can watch uh, on YouTube at the moment, but they're making it into a series now as well, so stay tuned for that. Nice. Yes. My name is Laguna Blue, and I want to be the greatest athlete in the world. Mainly what I do to market myself, I think, or my strategy as such to market myself, because I think anyone can go out and look at thousands of articles online on what to do and how to contact and should I cold call, should I warm introduction, blah, 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 blah. Um, what I've chosen to do is I, I kind of block my focus. So at when I first started... I really knew that I needed to let people know who I was and what I was capable of outside of DC because I didn't have an American accent and nor at that time was it elite enough to compete with people like your lovely self, <laughs> you know, in a world that I was just new and starting out in. So I knew I was different. So it was about getting a website. It was about finding... Um, through the internet, through uh, advertising agency sources, find the companies that were uh, promoting Australian uh, products, etc. Who were who was doing the Outback Steakhouse campaign? Steakhouse campaign. Who was doing the Yellowtail wine ads and things like that? So I was doing a ton of research, and that was my focus to get as well known. In, in the sense of I have a home studio, I can do this for you, I can be your one-stop shop for that. Fast forward to say now where my most recent focus because I'm really trying to extend my reach in animation and video game is personal connections because in that world I've discovered people don't want flyers, people don't want you know, oh, check out my new, I've just updated my website. To a great, to a degree, they want to know that you're there and you're relevant and you're working. But the most important thing for them is, are you talented? Can I work with you? Are you going to get the job done? And are we going to have fun doing it? And the best way to do that is kind of in person. So my current marketing strategy specifically this year, I suppose, has been face-to-face -face connections and going to cons and going to um, events and that sort of thing and just kind of being around and seeing people. And at the same time, though, I know that the work that I've done before with 
cold calling, cold emailing, making connections with companies, you know, reconnecting with people that I've worked with, even if I haven't worked with them in three or four years, knowing, oh, seeing, maybe even going and seeing something that they've done recently and just popping a quick note to say, hey, I saw this, it was great, just to keep relevant, but knowing that that's kind of happening in the background and if and when the animation video game world starts increasing here, then I know that I can ease the gas on that and bring it back up in kind of the online marketing sense of, as well. So my husband has a business that I help him out with uh, called 21st Century Thinking. And he and myself, along with a couple of other partners, design emotional intelligence programs for young people. And the point behind it is to teach emotional regulation and decision making, basically something that's extremely lacking in every school that I've ever seen. And one of the most important things I think for anyone and everyone to know. So it's been really special to be on that journey one of the programs that we offer is um, helping young people who've been through uh, childhood trauma to kind of, uh, they go through this program that's facilitated through theatre and therapy. We call it, it's really therapy disguised as theatre. I hope none of them are watching. But the whole point is to be able to learn the process of interacting and reacting and understanding your emotions and you know regulating your thoughts and feelings and making decisions on the fly and improv acting and all the great things that go into becoming an actor um we have a, a lady that we partner with who's was the head of the psychological association in western australia and she had designed these programs originally because she discovered that the correlation between theatre and kind of bringing these young people out of this emotional shell that they protect themselves with was an incredibly powerful tool. And we just felt, you know, how special and how important it is for young people to have that those abilities rather than get to 30 or 40 and be stuck talking to a therapist for the rest of their life because they didn't have that chance back when it would have helped. Not that there's anything wrong with learning those skills at 30 and 40 or 50 or 90, but if we can get children when they're younger and their minds and, and, uh, and bodies are able to more easily embrace and kind of involve themselves with that, it can help so much more in the long run. So that's been really exciting and special to be able to be a part of that. What would be um, a best piece of advice for up-and-coming voiceovers nowadays? Um, the best advice I could give for up-and-coming voice actors, newbies, is really get a sense of where the industry is now. I think what I've discovered is that I spoke to a lot of people like I did a ton of research before I went out when I started because I realized one of the things that I quickly realized is if you go out before you're not ready you're gonna sink and especially now with the internet everything lives forever so if you have old crappy demos old crappy work out there someone's gonna find it eventually and at the same time the industry changes so quickly that what was once relevant is two years later or five years later is not at all. So get as much information from as many people as you can because the people who grew up in the voiceover world only ever going to studios have a ton of valuable nuggets of information they can give you. Similarly, the people who only ever have done pay-to-plays or work from home without an agent their whole life have a lot of information and because I think the industry vacillates back and forth so quickly and or depending on where you live between an agency being important or a regional agency being more important than a than a 
quote unquote big market agent. Um, I, I just think I would say do as much research as you can to work out what's best for you, for who you are, for where you live, and for what you're capable of. And know, which is the other thing I discovered, is that what the entertainment industry likes putting people in boxes. And don't be afraid of that box. And if your box, like mine was, and what makes you unique is you're Australian, don't see that as a negative, you know. You have a really thick urban accent. You have a Middle Eastern accent. You only like doing e-learning. Uh, whatever it is, don't think that you have to be everything for everyone. Get really, really good in the niche that makes you unique, that people will remember you by. And then when people remember you and remember your name, then they start asking, what else can you do? Can you do this? Can you do that? Are you?" And then your answer is always, yes, I can, happy to. I would say the most defining moment of my life happened when I was in Melbourne um, and I had been working on a theatre show and a musical production for a couple of years, workshopping the production and doing a ton of work happily for free because I believed in the show. I thought it was going to be really successful and fantastic and it was hilarious and we got fantastic reviews. We were having packed houses every night. We went and performed at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, which is one of the biggest festivals in the world. There was a producer that came in and picked it up, said, I love it. I want to tour it around Australia, take it to the West End, everything. I had created my role along with the um, writer and composer and we all had to audition for the show because it was going to be, you know, a show where everyone needs to be on even playing field. It's professional to do it that way. And I didn't get chosen for my role. I didn't get chosen to be in the show, period. And for me, I had this whole moment of, oh, what is this career that I'm supposedly in where this one person gets to decide I'm not funny enough or, you know, entertaining enough or someone else is funnier than me. And, and that's true and there is. I just kind of didn't think it worked that way. I always thought you put the hard work in it comes back to you, but that's not the case. And so I, that was the point that I gave it all up and moved back from Melbourne to Perth and went and started working at a radio station because I wanted to get as far away from acting and performance as I could. I was working behind the scenes. But long story short, it was when I was back in Perth that I re-met Ed and that started up and we moved to America. And then from DC, or sorry, I moved to America to be with him. And then we moved to DC and then moved to LA and then here I am. So the thing that was supposedly the worst thing that had happened in my life, I'd been working all this time, put all of my heart and energy into this career that I thought was the thing to get it destroyed was really just me sabotaging myself and saying, putting all of my worth into this one person's opinion. And yet, if I hadn't have done that, the wheels wouldn't have turned and I wouldn't be sitting here now. So, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even do it on purpose! 